So we're taking up S-119. Um, the House has made several um, changes, and we're probably working from a side-by-side -side that's been paired by Bryn and that I believe would be on our committee website. Is that correct? Correct. <clears throat> Should okay. be posted. And we're... Um, Rep Representative Lamont, Representative Brad are joining this morning, joining us this morning to go over the changes. We expect Senator Nitka to be arriving shortly as she zooms from the Senate Appropriations Committee to the Senate Judiciary Committee. So go ahead. All uh, right. Senator um, Brad, Representative Lamont. Yeah, uh, Martin Lamont. Lamont. I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right. Uh, Martin Lalonda from the House Judiciary, South Burlington representative uh, regarding uh, S-119. Also, I didn't get the memo as far as the dress code for Senate Judiciary, so I apologize that I- It's rather uh, informal. Yeah, so, um, so I, yeah, I just wanted to give you some background on, on where we are with this particular uh, draft and in the process that uh, where we've arrived at this draft and where to go from here. Um, as as uh, you know, you you passed out uh, S one nineteen. We were under a lot of uh, time pressure back in May and June, and uh, we took the uh, advantage of the fact that we had some time during the recess to try to start gathering some uh, more uh, input from affected uh, communities. And to to uh, so we had three uh, public hearings. <laughs> Uh, in conjunction with government operations, uh, with the focus being on uh, S-124 and S-119, uh, though many people took the, uh, took the opportunity to expand the conversation and really pointed to many other things that we should be considering as well. <clears throat> we also had a survey that uh, did seek input on uh, S-119 use of force issues, and uh, almost 1,500 uh, individuals responded to that. And then finally, when we came back and started to take testimony, we did reach out specifically uh, initially. Yeah, we, we know a lot of the law enforcement community who wants to come and uh, testify on these things, but we really made an effort to reach out uh, to uh, members of the BIPOC and disability rights community uh, and had uh, testimony from seven different individuals who uh, weighed in from more from that perspective. Um, and what that, what the off session led to, because I did speak with, uh, in addition to those hearings, uh, uh, I did have conversations, I did speak with folks uh, in the BIPOC and disability rights community. Uh, I did also uh, touch base with the AG, uh, had conversations with uh, uh, Julio and uh, David Shear, uh, and also had conversations with uh, state's attorneys as well. And it led to the draft that we started out with, uh, the proposed amendment. We had hey, testimony. Martin, yes. Martin, could I just interrupt you for a second? A lot of the folks who may be watching on YouTube may not be familiar with the term BIPOC. Sure, I, sure. Because we've read Layla Saad's book, Me and White Supremacy. But um, for the record, Black, Indigenous, people of color is what Martin is referring to. Sorry to interrupt you. No, no, thank you for that clarification. Absolutely. Um, um, so we heard from uh, folks uh, from the disability rights community uh, and, and the BIPOC community. Uh, we had testimony from individuals who uh, felt that we had strengthened the bill from their perspective, but also offered some additional ideas. Uh, and we, uh, it, we put those into place in the, the version 2.4, which is the last version you all saw. Uh, and also try to address uh, some issues that we understood uh, uh, that you folks raised when you initially saw the amended version, uh, the first amended, amended version that we started out with. So we then had testimony last week from uh, law enforcement, uh, primarily uh, the, uh, the AG's office, but also some other uh, folks who are endorsing a stronger bill such as from the ACLU and uh, this draft is my attempt to find a compromise uh, between what we heard last week and, and what we had started with. Um, 
Unfortunately, I don't think that we've reached compromise. Rather than reaching compromise, my initial discussions, and we'll hear more in, in actual testimony today, uh, is that rather than bringing on uh, the AG and, uh, and, and hopefully addressing some of law enforcement's concerns, uh, we haven't brought them on board and we've lost, uh, I think, the BIPOC and disability rights community uh, who are no longer as, this is initial, I know you haven't heard testimony, you'll have to hear it yourself, but this is what I've heard. And the reason I raise that is I do want in, in context and in talking about this draft, I wanna point out uh, a couple areas that frankly, I had issues with putting in, and I'll explain that, uh, but did to try to see if I could find compromise. So with that, I will, I will hit on those couple points right away because the first one is right up front and that's the uh, section, wide, uh, section one statewide use of force policy. The concept going in as I was trying to understand from law enforcement particularly, but others, was to have the statewide standards, statutory standards, and then have uh, certain details and implementation and such uh, worked out in policy. Martin, can I just ask you which document you're referring okay. to because your sure. alternative language is very short and then Bryn has two here, a draft and an update. Right. Yeah, the, don't, the alternative language we'll get to in a bit. I'm, I can be looking at the uh, side by side, that's fine. If that works best for you as opposed yeah, to the I, bill itself. I, the side by side is probably the best document. Okay. Great. But I Thank would you. add that um, as you're still drafting this, and you mentioned testimony, we, we're we shutting down. Um, right. I don't know how we're gonna get any testimony. Right. Um, so this is sort of like having a unicameral legislature. Uh, as far as this is it, we're gonna get some testimony tomorrow. And, and uh, because we have two committees and next Friday is the end of the session, I don't know what we're going to do. Um, uh, so, but I have a number of questions. Uh, I don't know if you want to, if, if we can do section by section might be help, most helpful. Um, sure. Yep. So, I mean, I'll start with uh, section one. I won't go actually in depth as opposed to just talking the concept behind it. And, and Bryn certainly in a walkthrough can go. Yeah, more as we go that. through it um, with Bryn later on this morning, maybe we can get a better idea, but um, I'd love to have just your concept and, and right. where you're trying to, uh, what you're trying to accomplish. Well, that, that was specifically to try to uh, address um, concerns, uh, particularly of the Attorney General, um, to have uh, to uh, direct this policy making procedure uh, for more of the details and such. The problem that I had, and, and as I looked at this further, and, and there may be other issues with it, uh, is that it, it that there's a process already started in the executive order that uh, the governor uh, has issued. And, and how would these two converge? And there's some confusion about how that in fact would occur. So my thought has been in part to, well, let's leave it to that process that's already been kicked off and is already on its way, um, as opposed to then having this overlay in here, which may cause confusion and hold things up as much as anything. So that was kind of one of my issues with this. Um, the uh, initial input that I've received from the um, from Will DeWight and in, in the disability rights uh, community uh, is they, they don't like uh, uh, putting in place this policy procedure here. Uh, they, they don't want to endorse this kind of policy procedure, uh, you know, th but that's where they are coming from. My, my main point is that we can proceed with le uh, leaving this to the executive order and the process that was started there uh, because by putting this in here, I have not necessarily gained uh, any endorsements from anybody. So, nope. Representative Lund, it, it also is in um, S124, but not in such detail, but it is in 124. And yesterday we went over 124 with the Commissioner of Public Safety 
and to find out what the difference was and how they overlap. And there's no no problem at all with 124 and the executive order. They're just they work together really well. So I don't think this is necessary at all. Well, right. I want to I want to ask a question, if I might. Um, is the Criminal Justice Training Council the right place? And by that, I've heard um, from a lot of people that it's um, that should be one place that we should be revamping. And um, particularly in light of the fact that we're now changing directors, um, there is a nationwide, not just in Vermont, but nationwide questioning of uh, law enforcement training and how it takes place. And I'm not sure that um, vesting this authority, as we've done in the past, where the Criminal Justice Training Council is the right thing to do. I think we should be re-examining that. Um, and obviously, uh, that's more of a national issue, um, but it does hit home right here. Um, I've heard, at least in other states, for example, in New York State, um, even though they banned chokeholds following examination of the Eric Garner case, they found that the police academy was still in New York, was still teaching chokeholds with a wink and a nod. Right. And, and we'll certainly get to that issue as well uh, as, as one of the other points that I've tried to put in here for compromise, not finding compromise. I'm going to suggest that we no longer have it in here. So... It, <laughs> May I'm, I? I'm sorry, um, Senator. I, I know that this is gets very confusing because we have so many bills, but 124 also revamps the training council. It ha it adds many members and um, from different backgrounds. And I think that, um, so I, I, I realized that all of these kind of are working um, in parallel well, track. Well, I, I actually, I was referring to the wrong group. I'm not referring to the training council. The academy is what I'm referring to. Well, the, uh, the training council is over the academy. I realize that, but I should have been specific to the academy and not necessarily the training. So I guess the bottom line is, even though, and I apologize for the way that this, you know, but this is the way it works, I suppose, an iterative process that even though I'm presenting this as an amendment, uh, I'm not in, endorsing in uh, this section one uh, because okay. again, it didn't solve anything. And as I think Senator White is pointing out uh, is only added some confusion, which we don't need at this point with this bill, if we want to get it through. Um, okay. So I'll jump ahead to the next uh, section two, and that's, that's the standards um, for law enforcement use of force. And what we have done here relative to the Senate uh, bill uh, is we've expanded it somewhat, uh, though I have cut back a little bit since the last uh, version uh, to make it uh, not just really a focused on use of deadly force, which, which it largely was when it came over uh, from the Senate uh, to uh, kind of bolster the uh, provisions regarding use of force, you know, which also- What's the difference between policy and standards, by the way? Well, I think the main, the main purpose for that change of language was the confusion on uh, you know, law enforcement agency policies uh, and, and versus uh, a policy and statute. We wanted to make it clear that this is somewhat different than the policies that law enforcement uh, may be promulgating themselves. Um, it, it's not. It's not a critical difference. I. Uh, um, I think people would understand if we said policy instead of standard because it's a legislative policy. But I also think that when you say standards, that is um, more directive. If I will, you know, if I may, if that's the way to put it, uh, that that you need to follow these standards, uh, law enforcement. Policy sometimes seems a little weaker uh, to me. Um, so that's kind of why we went with that language. Okay. Um, I'm happy to answer particular questions, but I just wanted to, as a general matter, the idea was, uh, there's a couple main points that I'm trying to do in here. I am trying to follow 
what the current state of case law is. And, and I really defer to uh, Bryn on that, uh, even though I've you know, looked at case law and other things, but, um, but I'm trying to follow the, the case law, but there are a couple points in here that I think uh, the case law as it's developed is not particularly clear, and I wanna make it clear. And, and you already did in the S-119, uh, that you sent over as passed by the Senate. But I wanted to make it even clearer, and that is the definition of totality of the circumstances. And the way it came over the Senate was, it was all facts known to law enforcement, uh, including the conduct of uh, the subject and the law enforcement officer. I wanted to divide that up. I, I, I mean, it's yes, it's the facts known to the law enforcement officer is critical, but separate is that law enforcement uh, officer's conduct. And you had that in there, but I wanted to make it very clear. It's not like what was known to the law enforcement officer as far as that individual's conduct. It's kind of a separate issue. What was the conduct of the law enforcement officer? By, you know, not by his own witnessing of, of that conduct, uh, but objectively looking at that conduct. So we tried to make that very clear. The other part is making clear, and there's another component in this uh, revised version, and it goes to the uh, additional language that I sent Peggy this morning, uh, it has to do with the treatment which uh, of individuals who are suffering from uh, impairment, be it um, uh, mental health, uh, developmental disability, uh, drugs, etc. cetera, um, that, that in fact is at this point, although I'm sure others would argue, at least, at least when it comes to uh, it, um, deadly force. That's the issue that we've had in Vermont with respect to deadly force is, is how the situations have handled individuals who are suffering a mental health crisis. I'm not saying that there isn't biases, other kind of biases, and that excessive force uh, may be influenced by other kind of biases, but that, that really is why that is specifically pointed out uh, in that provision. Um, so we do have, uh, the Senate version uh, did have a bit about use of force and talked about it being proportional. And I really felt that we needed to uh, expand that because that's really only one leg of the stool uh, for use of force and whether it's uh, justified. And the others are whether it was objectively reasonable and uh, necessary. So that standard is now uh, made very clear. But what I did do uh, is I did eliminate, uh, I'm looking for this, where this is. Um, well, all right, so I'm not gonna say what I eliminated from the previous version. I had some additional language about what was necessary and what proportional meant, but that's been eliminated from this draft because uh, probably not necessary. So I would move just to this one additional alternative language that I'm proposing. Uh, and it would replace... Where are you? Uh, yeah, board? I'm going to tell you right now. It's at the bottom of uh, page 12. Uh, it's at subsection 5. Law enforcement officer's failure. Yes. Is the way it starts. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And in the language that I have proposed, and I need to actually get it in front of me as well. It's on the it's on the um, website. Is it's more it's more directive as opposed to, um, and it's more for deterrence than it is accountability. Is a, a one way I could put it that the way it is in the version that you are looking at in the side by side is. Uh, when we're looking at the use of force, we want to have one of the factors is what did the law enforcement do uh, in dealing with somebody who had one of these kind of impairments that affected their conduct. Uh, the proposed uh, di different language specifically creates a duty that, that when the law enforcement officer knows uh, that the conduct is a result of one of these conditions, uh, that the officer will, has to take that information into account in determining what is the appropriate use of uh, force, if any. Uh, it's, it's 
I think it's more, it's stronger language. It's more directive. It's not like after the fact, what did you do? You need to do this. Yeah, it, maybe it's a matter of semantics, but I think it's important. Um, and is that the way it's actually written in the statute? I'm looking at the bottom of page 12 and that its sentence structure just doesn't read properly to me. Uh, in, in the uh, alternative language that I separately <coughs> sent or what's in paragraph five well, on, this on page is 12 and 13? Paragraph five says a law enforcement officer's failure to take into account a subject's known to the law enforcement officer. I don't oh, know yeah, what- Oh that, yeah, that would need to be correct. <coughs> language, but I, I'm proposing that we go to this uh, completely different language, not completely different, it's, it's similar, but it's I think stronger language that I uh, sent separately and is not in that document, uh, the side-by-side -side at this point. And, um, well, I'm, I'm using two documents. Peggy, can you, is it Bryn or Peggy, is there a way to look at the document that Representative Lalonde is referencing? Um, Representative Lalonde, are you talking about just that paragraph that you sent? Yes, yes, just the paragraph, yeah. Sure, can it's on the website under... Well, but can you scroll that so we're looking at the same thing? Sure. It'll be easier. Because I'm, I'm in the side-by-side, -side and I don't want to leave the side-by-side, -side, go to find another paragraph. Yep, got it. With limited time available. Yep, hold on one second, I can share that. Thank you. Um... Assuming it's relatively similar, will they have time to make those uh, determinations? They're being shot at. Um, yeah, I think that that again, uh, all of this comes under the use of force uh, provision. I'm looking for it right now in the standards for use of force. Um, that it, I mean, it's at the time. It's the circumstances, the totality of the circumstances, which includes the timing. Right. Um, I'm looking right. at- So, you know, you're going to a domestic disturbance, the perpetrator is holding a hostage and is shooting at the officer. Right. Or officers. Yeah. Right, and, and, and in that it situation, you are, you are under the, whether you, you should be using deadly force and obviously the law enforcement officer at that point to uh, address a situation where there's a threat of uh, death or serious bodily injury is justified in using uh, deadly force. Uh, but if with, the officer confronts somebody on Church Street in Burlington and um, they are um, drunk, then that how does how does the officer deal with that under this? Right, I mean they would have to they would have to take I mean they have various de-escalation uh, techniques. They uh, have different levels of force that can be used, uh, and they have to take into account the individual's impairment when dealing yeah. with that. We're just mm -hmm. directing. We're not telling them what precisely they should do. That is part of their training and part of uh, what a policy would be underlying all this. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are saying that if you know that there's this impairment, you need to take it into consideration. Um, at, I, and I would I would point to the Grennan situation. Yeah, they eventually at the point where they actually had to uh, shoot uh, Mr. Grennan. Uh, they were, they had put themselves into that position where, where they, that at that point was justified because uh, from what I understand, but there were multiple errors <laughs> from what I uh, have read uh, leading up to that point. Uh, that doesn't mean that the actual, that it was justified uh, self-defense. Uh, Just let but, me say thank you to Representative Brad for joining us. She had to leave to go to her committee. So, I think throughout here, it's all impacted by the totality of the circumstances on whether uh, it was objectively reasonable, necessary, and proportional. And one of those aspects, but we took out those details, is the time frame that we're talking about. And and I don't think in any way does this uh, these standards take away the fact that 
oftentimes law enforcement is going to have to react in a split second, and it doesn't take away their uh, ability to do so when they have to. Uh, but it is laying out some uh, requirements, including their conduct leading up to this, uh, that should be considered, not necessarily in charging, you know, in a state's attorney's charging uh, a law enforcement officer with some crime, because that's not all this does. It, it also sets forth standards that can be separately uh, sued under uh, in, in a civil action in, in court. So, Mr. Chair. Think, Yep. Um, I, I just wanted to point to the word knows. Um, I, I see where Representative Lalonde is going with this language. Um, to me, the pivot point is the word knows, because I would think, unless you're in a very, very small town, um, yeah. the officer is not going to know the people when they roll up to the incident. And they might have reason to suspect, i.e., uh, a, a relative called in the incident and said, this person is going crazy. Um, is that really, can we fairly say that the officer knows there's a mental uh, condition in that case? Or could the officer argue, um, well, somebody said that he was going crazy, but I thought that meant he was acting aggressively, not that he had an actual condition. So it seems to me knows is the slippery point there. It, it could say something if the officer has sufficient reason to suspect or um, sufficient information, something, something like that. But, but knows is a pretty high standard, I would think. I, I agree, should have known would also be something we should use known, frequently. Yeah. For example, the person naked in the streets, and I can't remember what city, um, when his family called for help and the police, um, he started spitting and then they put a thing over his head and he suffocated. So, so specifically, you know, just to flag one case that, that certainly influenced my, my thinking on, on this as well, is a case that uh, is out of the Second Circuit uh, from May of, of this year, the end of May. Uh, it's uh, Chamberlain versus uh, City of White Plains, uh, 960 F3rd 100. And it was a situation where there were all sorts of opportunities that pretty clear that law enforcement uh, knew uh, that this individual um, had uh, was suffering from a mental health crisis. And despite that, they did everything to escalate it, it seemed, um, and led to this, this individual being shot. Uh, similar to the Grennan, uh, although much more egregious. Um, so in any event, that, that's, that's really that's the, the one. Uh, that, sorry. I, you, yeah, Peggy, you can take that down now. I think we have that. <clears throat> that's the substitute language for the section. Thank you. Right. So Other? I don't have much more to say about, I mean, uh, well, I have one more point, uh, place I want to point out, uh, and that is with respect to the use of deadly force. I'm looking for the page. Uh, page Bottom six, of page 16. Yeah, it's no, on it page. It actually is page 16. Yeah, page 16, uh, the use of deadly force is necessary, that, that particular language. Uh, I do understand that that in particular has been a concern of the attorney general, uh, or at least uh, Julio Thompson. Um, I, I mean, the bottom line is I think we need to, we need to uh, spell out precisely what we need by necessary. And the thing is that uh, the attorney general Donovan testified that with respect to the use of deadly force, and I think this is just a general understanding, that it has to be the last resort. Uh, that is in fact what uh, various uh, policies, including the Burlington policy, uh, and, and I would say Seattle as well, uh, they make it clear, and of course, I mean, of course it should be the last resort, but I think this language makes that very clear. It, it's, it's, and again, it doesn't affect you know, the individual uh, who just 
you know, has the gun pointed, the law enforcement officer who has the gun pointed at them, that they are fully justified in using, using that force. But it, it would seem that probably not that often when you get to that point, is there going to be another uh, option? But if there is, that, that needs to be followed. Uh, the uh, commissioner testified there's only been 183 state police um, incidents, use of force, so. Um, yeah, I've, did, I've did heard he testify that testify that with you uh, in your committee too. Uh, I don't think he's, he said that precisely. I think we've gotten the message of uh, what is the problem that you're, you're solving. Uh, my, my response right. to that is twofold. One is that I certainly think we have some issues in dealing with these situations where there's a mental health crisis, uh, especially since Burlington had a number of policies that they did not follow in the situation with Grennan. And uh, there are other situations where that kind of thing has happened, including in the Montpelier. I don't have testimony about that, but I, in talking offline with Rory Tebow, uh, you know, there are things that per, perhaps could have been done differently yeah. there. Um, but the other thing is, you know, I'm, I'm not looking just at, at the past. I, I'm looking, you know, I'm trying to be proactive. I think we're trying to be proactive with this. Um, so... I just lost the side by side. My computer just shut off. Uh, well, I know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I just I just hit my cord, but at least I didn't hit this one and get knocked yeah. off here. So I, I think there's one issue that I think we need to. I, I think I see that you know the direction other than the section one, your changes uh, looking at the side by side are. Um, I understand them, I think. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to understand on the bay, on page 20 um, of the side-by-side, -side, a law enforcement officer shall not use the right to self-dissent presumed to this common law of justifiable homicide. And then you point to 13 BSA 23053, isn't that the section that we are repealing? Uh, bill? Could you tell me this? I, I apologize since my top computer of page still... 20, top of page 20, you so, have a law enforcement officer shall not lose the right to self-defense pursuant right, to okay. common law or a justifiable homicide defense pursuant to 13 VSA 23053 by the use of deadly force that is in compliance with subsection C4 of this section. I don't understand. I thought that's what we all agreed to repeal and that's 219. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's not a repeal of the justifiable homicide uh, provision. That, that uh, provision uh, we sunsetted. Uh, we would be, instead of repealing it here, we'd get rid of the sunset and we have different language, which you would find on, if I had the side-by-side, -side, I'll let Bryn point out where that alternative language is. Um, is that on page 22, where prohibited restraint means the use of any maneuver no. or person? No, so it's on the, so the updated side-by-side -side that I sent 10 minutes before the hearing started. Yeah. Um, on page 24, that was the section that was inadvertently dropped from the first side-by-side -side I sent you. So it's section five of the House proposal of amendment. So it rewrites that justifiable homicide statute. And I think that that um, was actually, that language was included in the previous draft you looked at, 2.4. Well, so on page 22 starts a law enforcement officer acting in the office capacity as a law enforcement agent, a enforcement may use a prohibited restraint if the use of deadly force is justified. Is that what we're talking? No, so that is the um, prohibited restraint crime that was established in 219. So there is also additional language in that prohibited restraint crime. Um, but in addition, the justifiable homicide statute is amended rather than repealed and that is in section five. So what did we do with the new law that we passed that's effective October 1st? Is that repealed too? 
it is it's repealed it, but it's reinstated in this uh in this amendment so it's so reinstated we're, with we're we're taking what we passed in s219 and repealing it and reinstating something else is that correct um it's reinstated largely <clears throat> as it passed in 219 with that with the addition of that subsection c on page 22 and a, and a change to the definition of prohibited restraints. I think Senator Baruth has either a comment or a question and Senator White has either a comment or a question. Uh, more a comment. I, I believe I understand what this draft is doing with regard to 219. Speaking for myself, um, I don't like what it does with 219 because it adds again that permissive language that we saw in the first draft. Yep. Um, so what I would suggest is a possibility is that we um we here it repeals the sunset for for that part of 219 i like that but i would um if we struck out the part that modifies 219 um then i then it works for me um because it seems schizophrenic where in one place in the bill it says a prohibited restraint may not be used for any reason and then in this section, it says it may be used. And I don't see how uh, anybody can expect clarity if the bill says two diametrically opposed things. So I suggest going back to our language on 219, well, keeping I, the repeal of the I, sunset. I would go back to, oh, I just want to make clear to both Representative Lamont, Lalonde and um, this committee, my intent is to do one of three things assuming the House passes a bill, we would either concur, we would concur with proposal of amendment, which would be amendments, if this passes the House, which would be amendments that we would agree upon in here in Senate Judiciary, or we would um, ask for a committee of conference. But those are three choices. Obviously, as late a date as we're talking about and with expected adjournment, on the 25th, requesting a committee conference could be uh, problematic. So probably the preference would be if there are sections that we just can't agree with, would be um, concur with further proposal of amendment. So, so yes. I and then agree. Senator, yeah. but Senator White has, did you want to comment on Senator Bruce, Representative Long? Uh, I did, If, if uh, unless Senator White is going to comment. I'd like to comment on what Senator Bruce uh, just said. Well, I was, going to, I was going to throw in yet another option, a fourth option here, which is not to do this bill at all right now. I have to admit, I, and maybe, maybe I just don't understand what's going on, but I don't even have a clear understanding of what it is the House proposal is because it it was in a side by side but then we heard this morning that all of section one is out and section the other section has been somewhat changed now so i don't have a clear understanding and i don't know if this has actually passed the house judiciary or if there will be additional changes potentially i don't think we have time to well, address this bill properly this year at all. And so I'm offering a fourth alternative, which is not to do this bill at all, to have 219 as we passed it and take this up next year. That's my, I, I am well, very- that, that, is, that is another alternative, but fortunately we don't have to make that decision for next week. No, we don't, but I'm, I'm cause I don't even have a clear understanding of what it is the house is proposing because no, they yeah. haven't actually proposed it yet. Sure. Understood. And that's why this is a very strange way of doing business. And, and You're correct. And maybe that the fourth choice would be to recommit the bill to the Senate Judiciary Committee, if oh. it makes it over. Okay. Sure. Um, <clears throat> to to uh, Senator, Senator Bruth's uh, point, uh, that this is another provision that um, was my apparently futile attempt at trying to find compromise. But the language that we have in there uh, modifying section uh, the 219, S219 crime, prohibited restraint crime, uh, that language just makes explicit what is already available to law enforcement that may have used 
uh, a chokehold and uh, in a situation where they're grappling and there it is a um, life and death situation and deadly force would otherwise be justified. Uh, we're, I tried to make that explicit in here to hopefully bring along more uh, of law enforcement, but taking it out doesn't really change anything, frankly. Uh, they, have, they still would have uh, the justifiable homicide statute, which we are amending, uh, would, would amend in this if it gets all the way through to uh, Senator White's point. Uh, and, and, and the common law defenses are there as well. So uh, I'm, I'm going to be suggesting when, we, when uh, the House uh, is discussing this and hopefully we'll have a vote, and I believe we will have a vote, that that section is going to be taken out, uh, the, the modification to 219. Again, that's what I'm going to propose, but of course I'm only one of 11 members there, but I, I do feel that we're gonna have support. Uh, I know, because this in part also goes, it approaches from what I understand what the Senate has done and it approaches what the BIPOC and uh, disability rights community has weighed in and it's going back in that direction. And I do know that, I think I'm pretty sure there's a majority in our committee uh, that would endorse that approach. So, um, so the bottom line as far as this draft and where I, I perceive it may end up at the end of the day with, uh, with House Judiciary, but, but I'm not the master of ceremonies over there and can't force this issue, of course, but, but I would say that, that we're going to, at least where I'm going to be, is going to be eliminating section one, having that alternative language that I showed you for that subsection B5, uh, and eliminating what is section three. Uh, and, and the rest of the bill would be as it is revised here. At least that's certainly what I hope that at the end of the day is, or the end of this week uh, is something that we would vote on. But of course there is still testimony to be taken uh, this morning. Right. Uh, and there is a suggestion of some language that the Department of Corrections is wanting to have somewhere. And this seems to be the right bill to put it I don't have any details of what that is right now because uh, I think that's being presented to our committee right now. Yep. Okay. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time with us and that I would say this is still, a, as far as the House Judiciary goes, I think it'd be correct to say this is still a work in progress and we don't know what it'll look like the end of this week as it gets voted on, hopefully by the House rather quickly. Um, right. I'm worried about, uh, we've been trying to work a way to respond to this just as you were trying to find a way to respond to H2, S219 earlier this session while we were taking our time working on it. And that's why we split the two bills. We started as one bill and then split them in, in half. I'm, um, I appreciate you taking the time with us I think uh, I don't know what we will do. I'm really uh, I'm from a national perspective. From what I can learn, the police academies are one of the areas in need of rehabilitation. That's the way I can put it. And secondarily. Um, I think that um, in many cases, what frustrates the communities is when a police officer acts inappropriately. The ability, when it's clear, the ability to remove that police officer is difficult. But what we saw in so many cases recently is police officers actually fired for misconduct and do we have that ability in Vermont? Those are two areas where I see the public really being concerned. Um, obviously, you know, you all know more about what's going on in Burlington than I do. Um, what I do know, it's frustrating to 
um, for example, in the Woodside case, we have 11 staff members on paid administrative leave while we figure out what they did um, out of 30 that were working there. So when people say, well, why did you, why did you support temporarily closing Woodside? My answer is that they had 11 people. Um, so I, I, you know, and that, I think the general public gets frustrated with um, when it's clear. And so, you know, in the Minneapolis case, they were immediately for, uh, were immediately fired. I don't know if you can do that in Vermont. So those are two areas where I see the public calling for rapid change. Yeah, I think there's a lot of work to be done uh, next biennium. Hopefully we can get this small piece of the work done yep. <clears throat> before we leave. And I understand, you know, if there are, as you look at this and as you're talking to folks today, if, if there are other areas that jump out that, you know, you just won't be able to concur with, just please through Bryn or directly let us know. Well, I, I think uh, Senator we'll... Ruth expressed, Mike, the concerns of the majority of this community in terms okay. of that section. At least this member of House Judiciary is on, on board with, with, with those items that, that we've talked about today, so. Thank well, you I so much. I appreciate your time. I'll, I'm going to jump over to the other room. I know what it's like going from one Zoom to the next. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Martin. You. Bye. Um, Bryn, why not, can we take a, Peggy, can we take a three or four minute break and then come back to Bryn walking us through these in, in more detail, uh, forgetting the sections that um, he's already said are going to drop? Um, sure. So why don't we take a three minute pause? So um, I saw there was um, maybe um, Bryn, uh, this may be premature to even be looking at the house version side by side since the side by side is mm -hmm. changing as we speak. Can I, uh, I don't know if this is the appropriate place to put in a, a plug for Jeanette's suggestion here. I'm really concerned about this attempt to try to get something out on this before we break. Um, to me, this is probably the most important piece of legislation I could imagine this session when you're dealing directly with life and death issues and trying to balance those life and death decisions without us taking the appropriate testimony. I know we've done piecemeal testimony on this, but I really don't feel comfortable, especially given this is a work in progress on the House side, to believe we're gonna have the opportunity to take all the testimony we need prior to adjournment. And I know I may be speaking due to the pressure I'm feeling from the court system right now. And if I panned around my office, you'd see stacks of files waiting for uh, attention. Um, but the bottom line is, I this is such an important piece of legislation. I caught about one third of the testimony from the House watching YouTube versions. And the last person that was speaking that I saw was Wilda White, who was saying, Please don't rush this, do it right. And if she's telling them that, we haven't had that same discussion. And I'm really nervous. I, I think I'm happy that the House is taking testimony, trying to flesh this out. It probably will be a much better uh, piece of legislation to look at at the end of the day when they're done with it. But I'm nervous about whether we are going to have the time to try to properly respond. And uh, I'm gonna plug Jeanette again and say, I, I would prefer that we just simply have it recommitted to the Senate and call it a day. Well, luckily can I we... just add something? Yeah, but yes, okay. I, I think that one of the things that I've seen in this committee is that when there is an issue like this, we have very thoughtful and serious discussions among the, the five of us with um, witnesses and um, legislative counsel. 
And I don't think it's possible to have that same depth of, of uh, conversation and discussion and thoughtfulness in this, in this format. And this is one of those issues that I really think needs to have us be sitting across the table from each other and talking. Philip has a question. Well, it's, I guess it depends on. Um, we obviously don't have the time to get the testimony from everybody that's going to testify, but I um, think that um, we at least should wait before we make a decision until we see what they've done to our bill. Philip? I agree, Dick, um, to waiting. I, I feel some of the concerns that Joe and Jeanette are expressing. I do see a path, given what Martin said, that the committee was, his committee was prepared to, to throw out of the bill. I do see a path to a bill that I could support. For me, what it comes down to is how quickly does House Judiciary work? So if if we don't get the bill until 24 hours from the end, I think that speaks for yep. itself. Yep. So, but if we have, you know, sufficient time at the end to deal intelligently with it, then, then I would be for proceeding. Okay. Um, okay. I will send a message to Tim. Um, There are, I believe they're planning on voting it out today or tomorrow. Is that correct, Bryn? I have not heard that, so I can't, I don't know. Okay. I did I did hear that from Martin, that his goal was today with a fallback of tomorrow. Um, looking at the side-by-side, -side, um, you know, and, and we'll get an updated side-by-side -side once they make a final decision. Um, we can go through that and determine whether or not we're um, how close we are. Mm -hmm. You know, um, do, do we have? I, I still don't. I, I mean, I'm going to now ignore section one since he said he's taken it out. Um, so going directly to. Um, page six, where there's the first, we use, we just did deadly force and they use any force. Is that correct? And can, can you say the section, Dick, because I have, I, a, I don't have 12 uh, pages. I have it okay. or condensed. Uh, section one, it's our section one, their section two. You are right. Okay. Um, it starts on, it says statewide policy. Ours was law enforcement use of deadly force. There's our standards for law enforcement use of force. And then they added that force means physical coercion employed by a law enforcement officer to compel a person's compliance with the officer's instructions. So the two changes there, one is they define force, um, then define, then they agree with us on deadly force and what that means. It's the same as our version. Um, so the, the differences are they use standards for law enforcement. We use policy. We restricted the deadly, they go to all. Right. Yep, that's a good characterization of the of the differences on the first couple pages there. Yep. So, Joe, a question or comment? Yeah, Bryn, the uh, the difference simply being that they've defined force, expanding the title, if you will, beyond what we had limited to deadly. Is there any place else in this bill that something less than deadly force has actually been changed? as a result of that definition change? 
Um, let's see if I'm not sure I understand the question. They do well, expand subsection B, which is all about the use of force, not necessarily about the use of deadly force. Okay. Um, I guess that, that answers my question then. Then later on, significantly expanded that part that por portion of the standards. Okay. Later on, on uh, number item four, prohibited restraint means, and we use the term may prevent, and they struck out the may prevent. I don't That's think I like that. Um, and they do that in several places in this amendment because for consistency's sake, you remember S219 created that definition of prohibited restraint in Title 20 and in the new crime. Okay. Um, they've changed it in, in three places, including here. Okay. They've changed it to align with what we passed in 219? No, they've changed it um, so it doesn't include the word may. So it's any maneuver that that prevents or hinders breathing rather than may prevent or hinder breathing. And what did 219 say? May. 219 may said may prevent. May, may prevent, prevent, hinder breathing. The, it was the same as what you got in your okay. in your version of 119. Okay. That, what does that do practically? I think it limits uh, the it limits the definition of what a prohibited restraint is. Um, so it's 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 um, it, that prevents the hinders the breathing, not may prevent. So I could argue that what I just did when I grabbed somebody by the neck, I didn't intend to. Yeah, I think it makes as a part of the analysis whether or not the maneuver actually did hinder their breathing or blood flow. It. May I ask a question? So even that? though we know that grabbing by the neck may hinder, no, let me just finish so I understand. <clears throat> we know that um, that may hinder. Under our version, grabbing the neck would be not okay. Under their version, it might be okay if it didn't hinder. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you, Jeanette. So uh, I guess my question is more procedural. If in 219, it says that may prevent, and then if the House version passed on 119, wouldn't we have two conflicting um, statutes here? One Not ultimately, because what the House does in their amendment is to change that definition everywhere where it passed in 219. So, uh, it's, right. for example, in Section 3, we amend the, um, okay. the prohibited restraint crime. Section four, we amend the definition in Title 20. Okay, thank you. So basically, they're using the fact that the the effective date was October 1st, and they're planning to get this passed before the effective date. Dick, if yep. if we work back from backwards from what Martin said he was willing to do, he he said he was willing to get rid of Section three, which deals with 219 that implies directly that he'd be willing to get rid of these changes to the definition, because otherwise, as Jeanette said, we would have conflicting um, mm -hmm. definitions. So I, I read him as saying that they would be willing to get rid of all the changes, including these definitional changes. Okay. Well, I guess those would be things that we should communicate through yeah. Bryn with, if you could keep track of them, Bryn, so that we can communicate with us, judiciary. So um, that the, the, this committee doesn't agree with the change to the definition of prohibited restraint. Yes. So then they go on to all of that regarding the physical, the language barrier, alcohol impairment, et cetera. Correct, the totality of the circumstances definition. Yep. Right, so specifically includes those factors that may interfere with a person's inability to comply with law enforcement commands. I, any comments on that? I don't have a problem with that, actually. That looks good to me. So Fine. then we're now going to, we're still in the same section, Alice. 
Okay, uh, yes, I'm following you. Uh, there's a change on the bottom of page 10 or to achieve any other lawful law enforcement objective. So this language B2, this is where um, the House version uses the language that the Senate version had in B5. And that was sort of the one sub subdivision in the Senate version that addressed use of force generally, not just use of deadly force. So they've sort of adapted your language and moved it up to B2. So what right. this language in yellow does, the new clause there at the end, um, is added to the standard for law enforcement use of force. And essentially it expands the circumstances under which law enforcement may use reasonable, necessary, and proportional force. So um, the Senate version provided that law enforcement can use force if they have reasonable cause to believe a person to be arrested has committed a crime. So what this does is it says law enforcement may use force if it if it complies with these standards it to achieve any other lawful law enforcement objective, not just to arrest a person or detain a person who the law enforcement officer has reasonable believe, reason to believe that um, committed a crime. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so if now we're no longer talking about deadly force. So if there's a protest, peaceful protest, and the people are in the street and they're instructed to leave the street, would this allow them to use force in order to remove them from the street? I think arguably, yes, it would. That language, any other lawful law enforcement objective is, um, I think, pretty broad. It, it, essentially is, is uh, drafted to include any purpose that law enforcement have that is lawful. So clearing people from a street to me would probably be a, uh, a lawful objective of law enforcement. I would star that with a problematic. Okay. But this is referring to any use of force, right? Not deadly. Yeah, not I mean, deadly force, we restricted ourselves to deadly force if we were to agree with them at some point that any use of force, this is allowing um, them to determine what is a lawful enforcement objective. Um, well, well you, saw the, you saw what happened in Washington, D.C. at Lafayette Park when the I, president protest was removed and um, so allegedly he would have his photo op at, in front of the church. I, I just um, am thinking that if we're talking about any force at all, that um, there are times when law enforcement uses force because force can mean just compliant handcuffing. That, that is a use of force. So if, if you have... Um, a DV situation, for example, oh, where, um, they they haven't determined yet whether a crime has been committed, but you have a couple violent people here, and they need to cuff them in order to restrain them. That uh, that could be another law and um, enforcement objective to mm -hmm. to stop the the fighting that's going on. Um, but so if you're talking about any force at all, as opposed to deadly force. Okay. Next is, um, this is the section, trying to subsection um, four, whether the decision by the law enforcement officer to use force was objectively reasonable shall be evaluated from the perspective of a reasonable officer in the same situation based on the totality of the circumstances. And uh, we had language, they have language, and maybe you could help us understand what the difference is. Um, this is that uh, on pages 11 and 12. Sure. So bottom of page 11, top of page 12, the House added an additional sentence to this subsection that 
adds that the officer's failure to use feasible and reasonable alternatives to force is a factor to be considered in determining whether or not the, that use of force was objectively reasonable. So it essentially is, um, Representative Malone was saying earlier, it adds a burden on law enforcement to consider other feasible, reasonable, I mean, other reasonable alternatives to the use of force, if feasible, because that will be um, a factor to consider at, when considering whether or not their use of force was reasonable. I actually like that addition um, because it, you remember in one of their earlier drafts, they had a whole thing about you must use de escalation policies. Yep. And that was too, too specific and it seemed like it produced a lot of confusion. This is a way at getting at the same thing that, that uh, retroactively a decision will be made based on whether they availed themselves of other options. So now you have a note here that says the Senate version of B5 is the House version of B2. Yeah, Help I just with that. Yeah, I just placed that note there because you see on the Senate side, the left side, subdivision five is in highlight and you don't see anything next to it. And I'm just making a note that the House did use that language. They just moved it up to B2. And that, okay. that was the language we just talked about, about when uh, law enforcement is authorized to use force. So they expanded it in their version to include any uh, lawful law enforcement objective. Okay. And then they add in language um, in five is all new language. Is that correct? That That's correct. And this is also the area where Representative Lalonde presented a, some substitute language that he was going to present right. to the committee this morning. Bryn, is there a word or two or a line missing there? There's, I'm, I, I think that uh, Senator Benning pointed this out earlier. It looks like the word conduct was dropped. That happens sometimes with these uh, tables, unfortunately, okay. at the page break. Sometimes we lose a couple words. But I did want to point out that you may not want to talk about the language specifically because Representative Lalonde indicated he wanted to replace it with something else. So we can talk about um, his replacement language, um, which you looked at on the screen, Peggy put it on the screen. And that was the language that created a duty when law enforcement knows that conduct, that a subject's conduct is due to some impairment or other factor outside of the subject's control. Um, it puts that duty on using that information. Law enforcement has to use that information that they knew in deciding whether or not to use force. And again, Senator Bruce had pointed out that um, that word no is a key word because law enforcement had to have known that those facts um, in order to have the burden of using that information and deciding whether or not to use force. Yeah, I just think it's very tough to prove that so somebody um, knew something, which as Dick pointed out is why we go with should have known. Um, yeah because you just can't get inside somebody's head that way. Would you add that comment known should have been, should or should have known? Um, because Okay, so, do you want me to keep going? Yep, um, now we're at section, I'm trying to see, we're at C, use of deadly force. And C1 on page 15, and I don't know if Alice is able yeah, to follow. I'm following. I'm following you. Okay, they took out the words, the officer reasonably believes. Is that correct? Yep, they did take that out. Um, there was some conversation that that was just redundant language because we're also referring to the totality of the circumstances, which also refers to the officer's reasonable belief. So I don't think it necessarily fundamentally changes this language. Um, to take out those words. Other than that, that C1, that is the standard for use of deadly force and that language hasn't changed at all. And but then, you turn to page 16, you have some new language in subdivision two. Yep. Um, and that's the explanation of what the word necessary means in the context of the use of deadly force standard. Mm -hmm.
subdivision three is also new language that says that law enforcement has to stop using deadly force as soon as the subject surrenders or no longer poses an imminent danger of death or serious bodily injury. I'm thinking there about, um, you know, you see videos of people being tased mm -hmm. um, and when they tase them, they spasm and, and, you know, for obvious reasons, they, they throw their arms and they yell. And sometimes officers will retroactively claim that that's why they continued to tase them is because they, they didn't remain motionless um, in order to be cuffed, but but they're being, you know, electricity is being shot through their body. So when I look at that definition, I see when the subject surrenders um, or no longer poses an imminent danger of death or serious bodily injury, I I have some doubt about you know in in uh, in an earlier version I think they also included prohibited restraints, which seemed to me to indicate that you could choke somebody until they went unconscious, which in the case yeah. of, of the Minneapolis officer, that's what he was actually attempting to do via his training. So um, I, I think it's probably okay here, but I just, I wonder if there's uh, you know, as soon as the subject surrenders or no longer poses an imminent danger, um, I just wonder if there's a more specific or clearer, I guess it's okay. Well, you're uh, trying to bring the person under control. Once yeah. the person's under control, then it should be over. Yeah. I, I mean, that's... This is kind of one of those areas I'd like to get some more testimony on, though. When you're actually in the process of pulling out a gun to stop some use of deadly force by the suspect and you pull the trigger lots of times you pull that trigger more than once somewhere in that series of trigger pulls there could be an argument made that the person was no longer in imminent danger of death or serious bodily injury I mean, the officer was no longer subject to that. Right. Do we now enter into an area that um, splits hairs? It's just awesome. one of the reasons I'd like to have some more testimony from the other side to talk about it. What's the other side, law enforcement? Well, certainly law enforcement. Um, I'm, I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting emails from Beth Novotny about their concerns and the, the inability to have had testimony yet. Um, so I'm somewhat. I have not thinking. heard from Beth. Not, I suppose by saying that I will, but I, I don't. I, I don't believe I have. Um, I know that right now she's watching the House Judiciary Committee um, and their conversations about this entire bill. So I'm believing that we'll all be hearing from her eventually. But it just tells me that there's more information out there that we ought to be thinking about. Peggy, do you want to contact Beth and see if she's available for tomorrow morning at some uh, point? Yes, I can. I My screen froze, so I missed some of that, but Beth Devotny, I, I heard. Yes. Yeah, she represents uh, the Vermont Police Association. And on uh, S-119, should I send her as well as Marshall and Terrence all the documents from today? Yes. Well, the hard part is they keep changing, so... Yeah. I think for Marshall and, and Terry, they're going to be basically talking about the national effort and what's going on. And also, <clears throat> they have more knowledge of uh, Seattle than Marshall lives in Seattle. And I believe he's, he's been talking with folks from that area police department and so forth. So, which in, in large part, some of these changes have been based upon Seattle's policies. But they are policies, and I want to point out that um, they are, um, as I understand it, this is one of the questions that I'll have for them, is the difference between Washington state law and the policies that have been implemented in Seattle. And um, so you may have a different, you have, might have different policies in Tacoma, 
than you have in Seattle, but there's a state law that I believe is the minimum. That's what, one of the things I wanted to hear from them and understand. So you may want to look at what is Washington. Okay, I Zoom kicked me off for like five minutes, but what I'll do is I'll go back and listen to the YouTube so I can hear what you wanted. I don't want to take your well, time. Well, it's, it's just basically to have Beth Novotny um, testify regarding the house changes. Okay, regarding house changes. Okay, and if there's anything else you want me to let Marshall and Terrence know, just send me an email. I, I, I think you're fine. I okay. think they're fine with, with what we've given them so far. Okay. That was weird. It literally just, I just, it kicked me off. <laughs> me well, too. I got kicked yeah, off, I've been too. kicked off um, a couple. It was a, I actually got kicked out of a session of the Senate and it was a Comcast problem. Yeah. Um, five of us actually got kicked out of the Senate mm -hmm. session. Luckily, the voting was all done except for adjournment and nobody missed much, but <clears throat> I'd hate to have that happen during a, a you know, a, a vote on S54, for example, or roll call. Okay, um, so we are now at page 17, and there's just a... Um, yeah. I did not actually page 20 and I didn't understand eight in section two. That's at the top of page 20. Shall not use the right of self-defense to prove it. I, I saw that as a statement, uh, an explicit statement of what our understanding was when we passed 219. In other words, that even though we had a prohibited restraint, they would still have two means of defense mm -hmm. under common law and the justifiable homicide statute, and now as amended later in this draft. Okay. That's helpful. I, I don't know, did, Bryn. Yes, so they, um, they did hear some testimony that <clears throat> some witnesses wanted a, an explicit statement that um, an officer's use of deadly force in self-defense um, would be, they would still have the right to use uh, the defense of self-defense under the common law or the justifiable homicide defense um, if they used that deadly force in compliance with the standards. But you'll note that um, it specifically provides that that deadly force has to be in compliance with C1 through four. And so those are the standards <coughs> that are set out um, in C1 through 4, so it's that standard for use of deadly force in C1. And it has to be in compliance with that description of what necessary is. And also they have to uh, be in compliance with that provision that says that um, law enforcement can't use deadly force on a person who's um, just posing a danger to themselves and not posing a danger to somebody else. And also that requirement that law enforcement has to stop using deadly force as soon as the subject surrenders or is, is uh, no longer a threat. So the remainder of those provisions in subdivision C um, are not explicitly included um, in, in this language. <clears throat> and um, you know that was, that was a decision based on the, the members of the committee that were working on this draft um, based on some testimony or actually some conversations that they had um, with various stakeholders. Um, that raised the concern that if a law enforcement officer, for example, um, didn't intervene, um, if an officer was using a prohibited restraint or um, didn't follow another one of the explicit requirements under subdivision C, whether or not um, that person would, would um, lose their ability to raise the self-defense um, defense or justifiable homicide. Thank you. Okay, now we're at page 22. This is where I think we just opposed to this. What section is it? It's the one where it says Three. they can use a prohibitive restraint if they feel it's justified. Okay. <laughs> we ban the prohibited restraint and we say it's okay to use it if it's justified. I think yeah. Senator Baruth has been the long-term spokesperson. 
Yeah, no, I was glad to hear uh, Representative Lalone say that they would hold this. Yep. Section three. Okay, so I'll play devil's advocate. If a law enforcement is authorized to use deadly force, what difference does it make what type of deadly force is implemented? Well, they, they still have the defenses that we just went over. So um, what we're saying is these are prohibited restraints and elsewhere in the draft, it says they, they won't be used for any reason. So it, it seems like if it says they shouldn't be used for any reason, it's schizophrenic to then say, you may use them under these circumstances with that said, if somebody um, is acting in preservation of their own life, they should have a legal defense. So if you pull three, it goes back to what we did in 219, which is allow them a defense, but not create permissive language that um, seems to encourage that use. Seems like a schizophrenic double-edged sword to me. If you say they have the ability to use deadly force, at the same time you're saying they may not under any circumstances use a prohibited restraint, um, to me that's diametrically opposed. And I don't know what a prosecutor would do with that information. If the officer has no other available way of protecting himself and has to use something that cuts off the air supply, um, and yet you have a statute that says specifically they can't use anything that would cut off the air supply, how would the prosecutorial side of the equation come in on that picture? That's one of the reasons I'd love to be able to hear testimony from the Attorney General's office and from the State's Attorney's office and the Defender General about what that particular language does when an officer is subsequently looking at a potential criminal charge. Well, I, I think it's a question of what, in essence, what we're highlighting and what we're not highlighting as our, in, as our intent. And in terms of the prohibited restraint, I think we're making it very clear that we don't want it taught in the state and we don't want it used but we're being realistic in, in allowing these defenses, which are now explicit in the House bill. Um, so, you know, you're right, definitionally, it is a use of deadly force, um, but we're not saying that they don't have a defense if they use it, but we're making it very clear that our intent is that it not be used in the normal course of law enforcement. The, the uh, ultimate question is, can they use it as a defense if there's a statute that prohibits it, right. period? Well, in, in I don't same, know the answer to that question. That's why I'm, I'm nervous about doing this without testimony from all sides. But it, it gives them, you know, that there's that explicit section that says they have, uh, you know, those two defenses, top of page 20. I, I understand I? what you're saying, Philip, but the language specifically in a different statute removes that element, at least in my mind, initially looking at this, it removes the ability to use a prohibited restraint if, in fact, they're trying to raise justifiable homicide as a defense. Well, let's, let's ask if I could ask If I could ask Bryn to, if she's willing and able to summarize testimony that may have been provided on this section. So um, I would, they heard a lot of testimony on the section from various witnesses. Some witnesses were in support um, of the bill as it came over from the Senate. And um, some witnesses requested that there be explicit language in here uh, about the defenses for just the um, reason that Senator Benning is raising that um, a, you know, it was law, law enforcement was concerned that um, with this, with the explicit language and the standards that provides that a prohibited restraint um, shall not be used for any reason, that law enforcement may um, may feel the need to resort to using their firearm or some other sort of deadly force as opposed to um, using a using a maneuver that would be a prohibited restraint. 
And um, so I believe that the intent of the house was to add that language that specifically refers to uh, the defenses that are available for law enforcement um, to make it clear that if a law enforcement officer was grappling or in a struggle um, and the only, the only thing they could do to, to save their own life was to use a prohibited restraint that, um, that those were circumstances where it would be allowed. I think we this, did hear testimony on that from Mr. Was it Bloom from the criminal justice training uh, from the police academy. Um, I believe I was on the road when he testified, but I do remember that testimony. Yeah. On this. Mm -hmm. Senator White and Senator anybody. So it, it, it is very interesting that um, <clears throat> we are prohibiting this, um, this maneuver. <clears throat> we are not allowing any training to be you, um, held around it. And yet, if that's the only thing available to an officer, they can do it, but they have to do it without training because so they won't know the way to do it uh, I don't want to say safely, but the way to do it with the least um, consequences. So it is we deadly force is the use of the uh, a gun, but we do training on that, and so it's just I I am not um, comfortable with um, whether we've come to some kind of a a conclusion on this because I think that there are circumstances where they would want to use it, but yet it is specifically, as Joe pointed out, prohibited. So we're saying this is something you can't ever use and you can't ever be trained on, but if the circumstances warrant it, you can use it. No, we're not saying you can use it. Uh, that's that's what this draft is saying. And and I, I think that that's, uh, that that's extremely confusing. Yeah. So, so if we pull out section three, what it's saying is you, it's a prohibited restraint as passed in 219. Um, you're, you're not to use it. If a situation occurs that is, it's, it's life or death, you do have a defense, but we don't have language where we're saying, uh, go ahead and use it. And, and that's what I like least about the house version is that permissive language because they have the defense anyway, but you know, I thought what we did in 219 was the right thing, which is don't teach it, don't teach police that it's okay to use it, don't think of it as, as a tool in the toolbox, all of the ways that they've now been taught to look at it. Um, the idea that you're going to put your arm around somebody's throat and choke them till they're unconscious should not be part of what they're thinking of doing if it winds up being a, a you know, a last ditch self-protective maneuver to avoid death for themselves, then they have here in the house version an explicit defense. But I don't think we should be in the business of essentially promoting it. I don't see it as being an explicit defense, Philip, and this is the way I see it arising in a criminal trial. Officer is charged with um, homicide in one version or another, and in the defensive argument, the counsel for the defendant tries to elicit questions about what was happening and was there any other way to avoid this without a prohibited restraint. And the prosecutor stands up and enters an objection and says to the judge, it's not relevant. There is a statute, I don't know what the statute number would be at the time, but there's a statute that prohibits this maneuver specifically. So it's not authorized to be available for a justifiable homicide argument. But Joe, and the judge has to make a ruling. And I don't know what the judge would rule in that particular situation. No, but the defense, you know, as, as you well know, the defense would go immediately to page 20, section eight, where it says explicitly, a law enforcement officer shall not lose the right to self-defense per pursuant if they've acted within those standards. <laughs> so, um, so, so Bryn, if I could just ask quickly, 
when it says you shall not use lose the defense in in practical terms it's notwithstanding the prohibition on using it if if it comes under that uh shall not lose defense section is yeah. that yes that that is how i read that as well um, right so so a judge is is not gonna stick with the line uh -uh. that says it's prohibited uh in for any reason the judge is going to look at that next to the segment in this draft that gives the specific defense anyway. I guess I'm coming back to their language sounding better and clearer to me because it cannot be used unless the triggering device of being able to use deadly force is there. Okay, maybe we're under misunderstanding each other. I, I support page 20, section eight of the House bill which is the, the, and I tried to say that when I said, it seems to me to put in express terms, our understanding and agreement when we did 219. Yeah. So I support that. Is that what we're arguing over? Is that you think I'm not? Well, let, me go, let me go back to the, I want it to be very clear for somebody who is in that situation to not have to find themselves um, in front of a jury making the argument that I'm now looking for. So deadly force means any use of force that creates a substantial risk of causing death or serious bodily injury. Um, Bryn, you're saying that your reading of that means they could make an argument that the use of a chokehold is acceptable. Is that what I hear you saying? Yeah, I, if it falls within the standards set out in C1 through 4, which are those standards for the use of uh, deadly force, which requires that it be nece necessary, proportional, reasonable, and only under those circumstances that are listed. <coughs> See, I looked at the house language as, as being very clear in explaining that that maneuver was only acceptable if they were first authorized to use deadly force. If you strike that language from what we're trying to do, um, it seems to me you're still subjecting the defendant in a criminal case to a legal argument that a statute exists that specifically prohibits this maneuver. It prohibits it in any case, Joe, except page 20, section eight, specifically gives them the right to use it in self-defense, and then it cites the justifiable homicide statute. So if it, if it is judged after the fact to have been reasonable, proportional, et cetera, and in self-defense, then they're fine. And but, it, but in any other one, oh, yeah, one go ahead. Thing, which is why it doesn't refer to C8. It refers to C1 through four. So it doesn't it it means that that doesn't they don't have to be in compliance with the requirement that I'm sorry, C6 that a law enforcement shall officer shall not use a prohibited restraint. Oh. Okay. I get it. Yeah, I get it now. It's a torturous way of getting there, but I get it. I, I did, yeah. I do have a, another suggestion. I don't know if now is the time to 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 float it. Um, but one way that may be easier to reach this, um, the same place that you're at now, is by amending the language in the Justifiable Homicide Statute, Subdivision 3, to refer explicitly to those um, two sections of the new standards that set out the standard for use of force and use of deadly force. So it would be, it would refer instead of to the whole statute, the whole new standard statute, which is 2368, it would refer to uh, specifically B2, which sets out the standard for law enforcement use of force, and B and, and section C1, um, which is the standard for use of deadly force. And that way you would be excluding all of those additional um, 
factors in the standards, including the prohibited restraint. Yeah, language. I'd agree with that. I'd, I'd have to see that. It's a little confusing to try mm -hmm. to figure out the interaction. So you, you are suggesting, Bryn, to do that and then to take out other pieces? I think, you know, I'm just hearing the committee kind of grapple with that subdivision C8 is being confusing. And so I'm, I'm floating another idea, which may be instead of including that language in C8, you change um, the language in the justifiable homicide statute. So it provides that um, law enforcement can raise that justifiable homicide defense if um, they use force or deadly force in compliance with those specific sections of the standards on law enforcement use of force, meaning C1 and B2. So you would be excluding um, the other requirements, including the language about prohibited restraint. Do you see what I'm saying? So it wouldn't- I do. I essentially be able to raise that defense even if they weren't in compliance with the prohibited restraint language. Yeah. Philip, I understand you're having the same problem I am I am from the other side, and that is that the design of this language is still problematic. And if we ourselves can't understand it, that has me really concerned. The other part of this is we're dealing with this discussion in a vacuum because the house is still working on changes. And yeah. I have no idea what they'll end up with. Yeah. No, I I I think from this walkthrough, it's clear to me that we could get to a bill, I, I believe we could get to a bill that we agree on. It's dependent on, does the house stick with what they've got here or do they hand us a new fourth draft uh, two days from now? Yeah. Right. Okay, let's, um, since we've got about five minutes left to so 10 minutes at the most, <clears throat> I think we're, we're getting to a place where I'm comfortable with parts of the bill, but not all of it. And so I think we need to move on. They make an effective date of September, 20, September 1st, 2021 for the section on the use of force. Is that correct? That's correct. But I would say that that's probably um, due to the section one that it sounds like might be coming out because oh, okay. it's intended to give law enforcement time yeah. to come up with their own policy. Okay. All right. In, um, in preparation for tomorrow's meeting, can you look up what Washington state law is? Certainly, I can send that to Peggy. Um, they've got several statutes relating to the use of force. I can just um, include all of the ones that seem most relevant. Okay. Because we're, it's all very confusing but it's really not as confusing as it seems. Does that make sense? I, I We're doing our best to, to um, comply. It may fail, may not work, but um, I haven't thrown, thrown it out yet. So we'll look forward to tomorrow's meeting. And, uh, but we'll be there, whether we look forward to it or not is a different question. <laughs> Better way to put it, I guess. Um, so, so we'll see so you all at one.